All right. We have Tawana Dillahunt and Alex Liu, and they'll be talking about re-envisioning surveillance infrastructure through speculative design and photo voice. And I'll turn it over to you. Everything's good. Great. So thanks so much, Joe, for um, the invitation. Uh, thanks for allowing us to be here and, and managing logistics. I appreciate all the hard work that goes into a nonprofit. Um, so good evening, everyone. I'm Tawana Dillahunt. I'm an associate professor at the University of Michigan School of Information. Um, I'm also currently on sabbatical um, at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute as a William Bentick Smith Fellow. Um, I'm joined by Mr. Alex Liu, who I co-advise with Professor Mark Ackerman at the University of Michigan. So as I mentioned before, Alex is expected to be on the job market next year, and we're both really excited to have an opportunity to speak with you all um, and also hear your perspectives on our work. So today we'll present two distinct case studies about how we might re-envision surveillance infrastructure given the results of our work. So I'm going to start um, by uh, defining surveillance or giving a few definitions for surveillance or what we mean by surveillance. Um, surveillance derives from the Latin word uh, vigilare, which means to keep watch. Uh, the suffix uh, suya in French means over and via uh, to watch. Uh, so literally, surveillance is to watch over or keep watch. Uh, Per the Cambridge Dictionary, surveillance is the careful watching of a person or place, especially by the police or army, because of a crime that has happened or is expected to happen. So I'm just going to call out that there's a negative connotation with, with this um, definition. So in surveillance studies, scholars define surveillance in multiple ways. Uh, for example, Gilliam and Monaghan define surveillance as monitoring people in order to regulate or govern their behavior. So in this definition, we see three different parts of surveillance. Who is surveilled? Uh, people. Why surveillance? Uh, to regulate or govern. And how to surveil? So in this case, through monitoring. Um, we see that surveillance is always embedded in the knowledge power relations. And in each of the cases we see here, each part is situational. Um, we could monitor you know, through technology, we could surveil more than people. So each, each component here is situational. So there are numerous studies that have demonstrated that surveillance practices have disproportionately impact on individuals who are poor and belong to racial and ethnic minorities, primarily through the criminal justice and welfare systems. Today's surveillance technologies treat individuals as data points rather than acknowledging their lived experiences. Surveillance technologies, these surveillance technologies uphold a social order in service of capitalism. In fact, surveillance technologies have their roots in the transatlantic slave trade, labor control in factories, and population management of nation states. And their role in ongoing racialization must be acknowledged. Black feminist scholars like Simone Brown point out how surveillance technologies overlook the complexities of racialized experiences, while Donna Haraway highlights the damaging effects of the conquering gaze from nowhere embedded in large-scale surveillance infrastructures. In other words, modern-day surveillance ignores the subjectivity of the observer and the historical and cultural context in which they are situated. From the standpoint of economic production, Modern surveillance infrastructure is situated in and also upholding the tailorist ways of rationalization, as well as improving efficiency and productivity. And in workplace contexts, surveillance is often pitched as beneficial, uh, at least for employers. And we're seeing increased software demands for employee surveillance since the start of the pandemic. We see that 60% of companies with remote employees use monitoring software to track activity and productivity. As a result, there's work that suggests that monitoring employees can lead to increased profits due to increased worker productivity. So in thinking about who surveillance infrastructures disadvantage, we must consider the workers. So workplace surveillance shifts workplace power dynamics in favor of corporations that harm workers for inequitable growth Workplace surveillance enables illegal discrimination, leads to increased worker stress, and hyper enables the de-skilling of jobs and destroys worker autonomy. 
From a neighborhood context, we see how policing surveillance is employed in working class black and brown communities, often under the guise of increasing safety and decreasing crime. Despite claims of neutrality and objectivity, these technologies are based on biased data and reinforced biased systems, which leads to further harm toward low income and working class communities. As a result, the existing relations and knowledge within these communities are disregarded and made invisible. While our work mainly focuses on the work in neighborhood and policing context, I'd like to call out that much of what we've said about surveillance is happening in other contexts like housing, healthcare, and education. Now that we have a high level and historical overview of surveillance and the underlying harms embedded in surveillance technologies, we, return, we turn to the city of Detroit, which is the site of our empirical work. So Detroit is a symbol of American modernity. It's the largest black majority city in the United States. Uh, the city's medium income is about 35,000, which is slightly more than half of the state's medium, in, medium income. From the context of work, the genealogy of surveillance infrastructure in Detroit can be traced to Fordist labor control as seen in Detroit factories around the early 1910s. Fordism following Taylorism signifies intense labor for the promotion of production. At the same time, we can see the concept of neighborhood and policing, where the Detroit city government and police department have expanded surveillance infrastructures, including real-time surveillance cameras, facial recognition, and gunshot sound detection technologies over the past decade. So Detroit's Project Greenlight is a public-private partnership that is said to, quote, improve neighborhood safety, promote the revitalization and growth of local businesses, and strengthen efforts to deter, identify, and solve crime, unquote. This reflects what we said earlier about the narratives often justifying surveillance infrastructures. With these surveillance technologies, people and communities' viewpoints have been excluded. This holds especially true for historically minoritized and racial, racialized communities, uh, those who are often most harmed by surveillance technologies. So in our work, we ask the question, how can we trouble and re-envision surveillance infrastructures and their underlying logic? We present two case studies, both in Detroit. The first case study I'll present, which is speculative design and alternative economies. And the second case study, photo voice on neighborhood safety and surveillance is what Alex will present. Through these two case studies, we address three questions. And these three questions are gonna be our key takeaways for today's talk. So the first question is, how might we rethink surveillance with an embedded sense of care? How might we rethink surveillance through local relations and sensibilities? And how do we engage everyday people, especially those experiencing marginalization and whose voices we don't typically hear in our conversations of technology design? As we move into the first case study, I'll talk a little bit about the context of our work and what really what led us here. I'll also share a bit about my work for those of you who I haven't met as a point of conversation because I'll be here actually another year. Um, so for context, most of my work has been done in the space of employment, entrepreneurship, and the future of work. And throughout much of my work in this context, we've asked the overarching research question, how might technologies existing and new better support individuals experiencing marginalization to support their employment or economic growth. We've reached nearly 1,000 job seekers and stakeholders in our work through a mix of qualitative and quantitative studies and in using a variety of human computer interaction approaches such as participatory design and participatory action research, surveys and interviews, technological field deployments and evaluation. Most of our research has focused on job seekers perspectives, although we have contacted external stakeholders like career counselors for a more comprehensive understanding of the employment process among our job seekers of focus. While the focus of my work was not surveillance explicitly, we also encountered adverse effects of job search monitoring in some of our later work. So monitoring and surveillance in an employment context applies to both workers and job seekers. Uh, it really goes beyond workplace surveillance, but you know the, the actual job search. So in this case, we're talking about monitoring um, which jobs you actually apply to if you're unemployed. Um, so some of the regulations force people um, to 
to apply for jobs that they're overqualified for, but just for the sake of kind of completing a checkbox and receiving their unemployment check, they're, they're monitored and, and uh, forced to apply. So the aim of my earliest empirical work was to investigate what type of support job seekers valued. This work showed that they appreciated tools that provided application feedback, connected them to offline resources, and specified where to obtain the skills that they needed for employment without requiring significant digital skills. This meant no complex logins or need for stable internet access at home. It also meant that the process was achievable through a mobile phone since many didn't own or have easy access to laptops or computers. Thus, part of my research has focused on understanding how to develop tools that center job seekers' needs and capacities while bridging gaps in digital literacy. Without going into too many details, one key finding is that involving job seekers in the design process, which is a form of participatory design, is empowering. So not only do they begin to see themselves as designers, but they also value their contributions back to their communities. And this brings me to my current work with some of my colleagues from HCI, where we argue that it's time for us to reimagine new systems and raise the narratives of those experiencing very, various forms of marginalization so that we can inform the future technologies that are being developed. So the challenges we discussed earlier, technologies perpetuation of Taylorism, racism, discrimination, and harm, however, extends beyond engaging marginalized populations in the technology-based education to positioning them in roles where they envision how they see technology amplifying their strengths and values. So where do we begin? So the work I'll present today builds off of a collaboration with my colleague, Professor Christina Harrington. We began eliciting tech futures among Black young adults in a remote speculative participatory design study during the COVID-19 pandemic. The work examined technology's role in the imagined futures of Black young adults in a Chicago summer design program. Our research revealed that the youth encountered difficulties in imagining a future free from today's social issues. So race and social class obstructed their ability to envision the future. We came to understand that the act of envisioning requires disrupting the system that normalizes oppression and is based on cultural hegemony. This hegemony is perpetuated through technologies and spaces that prioritize certain groups and identities, which limited our participants from thinking radically about the future. As a result, the youth's utopian aspirations centered on having access to basic resources and their visions of the future were limited to their immediate experiences and surroundings. So, you know, what did we do after seeing those results? Um, what we did was we turned to Afrofuturism, which is a genre of speculative fiction that intentionally explores futures created by and featuring Pan-African experiences. As you might be able to guess from the beautiful images shown in the slide, um, this is a cultural, artistic, and literary movement that imagines a future where Black people have a prominent and positive role in society. It combines elements of science fiction, fantasy, and African mythology to create new visions of the future. So we situated our design approach in Afrofuturism to provide a more empathetic design engagement when compared to traditional speculative design approaches. For context, Speculative design approaches help critique design and align with other practices like Afrofuturism and design fiction to pose challenging questions about the relationship between technology, design, and culture. Our results informed the development of the Building Utopia's Afrofuturistic Speculative Design Workbook, which contains innovative probes to elicit technology and design futures. Dr. Harrington and Kirsten Bray designed this workbook for community leaders, for organizers, research practitioners and designers to build and reimagine new technology and design futures. They also added a card deck that served as a probe during the workshop. So examples included the liberation card, the forecasting and methods cards. To assess this workbook, my team and I facilitated a five week remote workshop series with black and brown Detroiters fighting for economic justice to help answer the question, what are the imagined economies and what's technology's role in, these, in supporting these economies? So in this work, we wanted to empower community participants by inviting them as designers who collaboratively documented design fiction and digital artifacts through storyboards to imagine new models for employment, economic development, and growth. 
We invited them as technologists who envision and imagine how technologies could support these models for economic development and growth. We invited them as evaluators who provided us with feedback on, a, on this design workbook that was created to guide us along the process. Finally, we invited community participants in as thought leaders who shared their expertise and wisdom throughout the sessions. Just so you know, we handed, uh, we handed these workbooks to our community partner who then gave uh, the workbooks to community participants for our study. So we assign homework after each week and discuss the homework the following week. So just to give you an overview of what happened in these sessions, um, the first week really was an introduction and educational session where we explained the meaning of speculative design from the perspective of our field. We used clips from Black Mirror, which is a British anthology television series based on uh, the Twilight Zone to demonstrate how media conveyed such futures, which in a way was mind blowing for our participants. We also took the time to explain the concepts of utopia and dystopia through these episodes. We also explained computing concepts like robotics, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things. So another goal for us was to educate communities on such technologies and identify them in Black Mirror Clips so that it can see them in action. Um, we thought that this could help people envision new futures and also understand the role in which technology played. So in weeks two and three, we identified community values and strengths. Um, I just want to take a second to, you know, ask, you know, ask you to consider what might a surveillance infrastructure that considers a community's values and strengths look like. So you just take a minute to just think about that. We're going to, you know, talk about the results of the study, but, but I invite you to, to, to think about this for yourselves. So with guidance from our community partner, we used a tree metaphor. Um, the roots of the tree represented community values, the trunk represents strengths, and then all our alternative digital economies represented the tree leaves that would bear fruit. So the community values here represent the top three values from the community organization. Um, community participants voted on multiple strategies of power, anti-racism and anti-capitalism, and leaderful movements as their top three community values. Um, for their community strengths, um, these included, you know, trusted community uh, members, community leaders, neighbors, friends, mentors, and, you know, I was excited that they said professors, um, community elders, family, um, the contested church, and then um, people called out young folks for tech support. We spent the fourth week building on these values and strengths to reach utopian futures. So as researchers, our interest here, again, is really understanding what role technology played or could play in reaching these futures. So we probed here for alternative digital economies. However, in today's presentation, I'm going to focus on aspects of surveillance that arose. So just for context, um, we encourage groups to think about the future. And, and I just want to call out that there were very similar themes. Uh, representing, you know, their, their values. So we saw things like decentralized childcare and communal childcare. Um, people describe childcare as being like a miniature United Nations of ambassadors. Uh, people talk up, talked about the importance of children constructing their own uh, learning and curriculum. Um, in terms of, you know, technology's role, I really want to call out through um, some of the discussion around uh, robots as, as an example. Um, so, you know, people said if we use robots, it's really to support parents in supporting their parental roles um, and ensuring things like proper nutrition. Um, we're not using robots to take over <laughs> the role of parenting. Um, so thinking about technology as being used to help us instead of taking over uh, for us. So that was uh, kind of an underlying theme about technology's role. Um, we also heard themes of parent, uh, parental housing co-ops, volunteer-based babysitter programs, and then we heard things like time banks, or which required a currency that was built on trust. So another central theme uh, for utopian alternative economies included um, surveillance of love. And I'm going to talk about this given the topic of today's talk. So in, in one utopian future, um, love was at the foundation of the economy. Here, community members imagined that neighbors, churches, and the community uh, saw nothing but love 
Uh, they imagine using uh, technology to surveil uh, for love, really, so that they could understand who in their community wasn't receiving enough love. So they could find out through this technology who wasn't receiving enough love so that they can provide that support um, to those people. So in contrast to um, our current surveillance infrastructure that surveils for low productivity, uh, this form of surveillance surveilled for people's feelings, really, so that they could be provided with the support they needed. Um, here, Detroiters are more concerned about the person's well-being. Uh, they weren't looking to surveil people for crime or, or even safety for that matter. Um, I do want to call out, however, that this led to critical inquiry about how technology was developed, how it was regulated, and how it was owned. For instance, um, how is love sensed if we surveil for love 24-7 to provide community support? Who surveils? Who senses? Uh, what if we don't love or show love in the same way? Um, many of these same questions about technologies that have already been deployed, um, especially in minoritized communities, uh, could be asked or should be asked. Uh, and part of the work uh, I'd like to do well in this area is to inquire how we might hold community conversations beforehand to consider how technology is deployed. So had we had such conversations earlier, you know, one question is, would we surveil? Um, if so, would we do so in the same way that we do today? So we concluded the series with a discussion of tangible ways and next steps to work toward our utopian futures. The last session was also a way for us to serve the needs of our community partners. So Alex and I learned from our community partner that they use these visioning spaces to work toward their values. So these sessions helped to inform their campaign strategy and gave the community causes to mobilize around. They could use the elections that were happening in the next few months as a vehicle to drive their issues forward. So in thinking through our first question, how might we rethink surveillance with an embedded sense of care? For Detroiters, rethinking surveillance meant prioritizing care and centering community values within surveillance infrastructure. And this looked very different from the reductionist approach in the current surveillance infrastructures, the current surveillance infrastructures embodied. So here, rethinking surveillance means redirecting the focus from Fortis and Taylor's reduction to care and community values. So the key takeaway here is, you know, what does it mean to rethink surveillance again so that there's an embedded sense of care? And I'd like to return to this later, but you know, a question to consider is: do we even call it surveillance? Um, another question to think through is what is technology's role and is technology necessary? From a methodological standpoint, our findings suggest that moving toward equitable, inclusive, and sustainable futures requires new and evolved research approaches like combining Afrofuturism with community-based participatory approaches. Detroiters inquired deeply about consent, programming, and technology ownership. I'd like for us to consider how this approach led to such impactful conversations. Uh, what other approaches might lead to similar outcomes? And what else could we do as HCI researchers and practitioners to have these conversations with everyday people, especially those who are often most negatively impacted by the technologies that we design, develop, and deploy? So I'll next turn it over to Alex, um, who will discuss case study two, uh, photo voice on neighborhood safety and surveillance. Uh, thank you, Tawana. Tawana, do you mind if I uh, share my screen? Sure, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, thank you, Tawana. So hi, hi everybody. I'm Alex and a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan School of Information. And my dissertation project, project looks into the genealogy and imaginaries of surveillance infrastructures in the city of Detroit, particularly its role in racialization and the making of working class in the city and how the surveillance infrastructure is mobilized through affective confidence and management. And today I'm going to present part of my dissertation project, the photo voice of neighborhood safety and surveillance. And this work has been recently accepted to um, this year's CHI. So um, again, as Juana mentioned earlier, in the city of Detroit, the city government and the police department has deployed a parade of surveillance technologies in the name of reducing crime and promoting safety since the city's bankruptcy uh, 10 years ago. So this rhetoric of promoting and improving 
or improving safety is actually prevalent among a lot of digital tech, digital technologies or digital surveillance technologies out there on the market we see today, such as um, Amazon Ring Doorbell and more. Um, however, what does safety even mean here? Whose safety should be considered? And when safety is when safety is achieved, all these questions remain unaddressed and fuzzy. Um, and as, uh, as such, so this photo voice project really aims to look into this prevalent conflation between surveillance and safety, and or put it differently, it aims to challenge the regime of surveillance as safety and look into what the alternatives are through engaging community members in addressing those questions. Um, we conducted we conducted this photo voice project in collaboration with a local community organization on Eastside Detroit last year. So first of all, what is Photo Voice? Um, so Photo Voice is a community-based participatory research and a participatory action research approach based on the understanding that people are the experts in their own lives. Um, Photo Voice advocates an asset-based perspective by offering a space for participants to document and communicate both community assets and concerns through photography and eventually identify community actions for change. Um, at the same time, photography is a kind of art form and artistic artifact that embodies a lot of meanings and relations. It allows community members to share feelings, stories, and narratives that are hard to capture through text and language. language. Uh, Photo Voice was originally conceptualized in the fields of public health and social work, and I first came across this approach back when I was a, a social work student back like a few years ago. And photo voice is still quite new to um, our field, like in HCI or UX research. Uh, but we see there are a lot of opportunities for us to uh, employ uh, approaches like this to really think about or uncover the nuanced relations within the socio technical assemblages. And our photo voice engaged uh, with 11 mid age and senior lifelong Detroiters from Eastside Detroit neighborhoods with an average age of 65 years old. All our participants were black and 10 of them were women. The majority of them have an, an annual household income lower than $30,000. So what, what did we do? Um, the photo voice activities consists of three main phases. Um, in phase one, we conducted an onboarding workshop and an educational workshop with all participants. And similar to what Swana said earlier, we included an educational component to this project. Actually, one community partner of this project is a professional pr photographer. So he and I co-organized this educational workshop together. And during this workshop, we walked through some basic techniques of photography, such as uh, composition of photos, the rule of three, foreground and background, and the application of reality and symbolism in photo photography. And as a collective, we also viewed a lot of photos from the classic photographers such as Gorbin Parks and Dewan Bay and discussed photography's role in catalyzing social change in history. <clears throat> and in addition, we also learned about and practiced some tangible photo taking techniques on smartphones, such as like zooming in and out on, uh, of the lens, sharing photos through messages and emails. In fact, at the end of the project, our community partner and a lot of community members appreciated learning about and practicing this uh, basic digital skills during the educational workshop. And after the educational workshop, participant has three weeks of time for taking photo based on the series of uh, probes we offer. So very broadly, we ask uh, participants to take photos of what safety means to them, what surveillance means to them, and how they interact with surveillance technologies in their everyday life. During their photo taking, we also offered office hours and in-person check-ins to uh, support participants' technical questions or address their technical questions. And participants also invited us to their neighborhoods and home spaces in person. And during the photo taking, I visited each participant multiple times to um, catch up with them, follow up uh, on their photo taking progress, walk through the photos they have taken, and observe their photo taking and everyday life processes. So, for example, as you can see um, on this picture, uh, on this picture on the screen, the participant was trying to take a photo uh, of her community garden, and she wanted to capture the whole garden in the photo and create the perspective that the viewer was a bird looking from above. Uh, but after a couple of like unsuccessful trials be because of the technical limitations of her phone, she decided to find a letter 
and take a photo standing on the ladder. Um, so after three weeks of photo taking, we conducted one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews with each participant to go through all the photos they took and the stories behind each photo. And each participant chose two to three photos to share with the group based on um, those they, they think is most meaningful to them personally or most meaningful to the community. And finally, we conducted a group photo viewing and reflection workshop where all participants reviewed and discussed each other's photos in the smaller groups. And we came back together as a big group to identify the shared themes, what, it, what all those photos mean to us as a community and what kind of community actions we should take going forward. Um, in fact, during the workshop, participants also wanted to host a community event to showcase their photos to the broader community members who were not really part of the project. So the community partner and the university partner collectively planned and organized and hosted this community-based photo exhibition two months later. Um, and our participants collectively brainstormed the name, Every Photo Has a Story, an east side story on safety and surveillance from behind the lens. And the exhibition included attendees from various groups, including um, participants, families, and friends, and neighbors, and also uh, community, other community members, community organizers, uh, folks from academia and the media. So for, for this exhibition, participants' photos were printed in the size of eight by 10 inches and displayed on stands around the, the community center along the captions created by the participants and during the event, all 11 participants were able to showcase, showcase their selected photos and the messages they wanted to share through those photos. Um, and this photo served as a starting point for attendees to start like engage with the dialogues with one another and reflect their own experiences with the community safety and surveillance. Um, you can refer to our case study for more details and takeaways of organizing community-based events and participatory action research. Um, I also wanted to emphasize that while like the photo voice activities only consisted of the three main phases, but the whole collaboration process like between the community partner and the university partner extends much longer than that. So there was a long period of like prep, collab, collaborative preparation before the, the research activity started and also ongoing collaboration efforts on sustaining the research efforts and informing community actions. Um, yeah, after the, 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 the those three phases up until today. Um, so next, I want to go through a couple of key points on how this work could help us to rethink safety surveillance and their conflated relations and how, what it means for us to, um, to, to, to find the alternatives and rethink surveillance infrastructures. First of all, um, to community members, Safety is very relational, situational, and multiple. Probably when we when we think about safety, it probably means very specific things like, uh, you know, like avoid specific harm on the street or avoid certain things. Um, but their photos and stories demonstrate the very intricate relations within their safety networks uh, in their neighborhoods. Um, and this neighborhood, uh, this networks include not not only human actors like their family members, neighbors, and friends, but also a wide range of non-human actors, including animals, for example, like their pets, like their dogs, their wild animals, like birds, rabbits, bumblebees, or plants, like the trees and flowers, and even uncut weeds around them. And also material objects, like stair lifts at home or abandoned houses in the neighborhood, and spaces like vacant lots and community gardens in the neighborhoods. So for residents, their sense of safety it stems from all these relations in their everyday life. And in this way, safety is deeply relational and situated in a particular time and space. And what safety means is internally multiple and fluid from achieving, uh, from achieving bodily autonomy in home spaces for some older, more senior participants to avoiding threats and fear in the public spaces to even seeking peace of the body, mind, and attune themselves to the nature. So to navigate and achieve the sense of safety, residents had to practice what we call everyday noticing. Uh, so the idea of everyday noticing is built upon anthropologist Anna Tin's notion of the art of noticing. And in our case, practicing everyday noticing requires residents to attune, uh, attend to their encounters with the surrounding human and non-human actors we mentioned earlier, 
and they carefully attune themselves to this actor's rhythms of living and relating to one another. And I want to show like some examples of how that looks like through photos. So the visual process of seeing is very critical, is a critical mode of residents every day noticing. Like Ms. Tamara mentioned here, like I tell people, you got to be safe. We got to look out for each other when things don't look right. Um, I know how things look over here. So if I don't see Miss such and such out after 10 o'clock, then I think, oh, is she all right? Because that's not normal how she do. Or I know that I got a neighbor that come in at 10 or 11. They come from work. Um, so it's just the awareness. You just got to be aware of things. And as you see, as you, 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 you see here, everyday not noticing is not only simply about seeing or observing what is going on in, in one's surroundings or what's happening in their neighborhoods. If we think about what Tawana mentioned earlier about in, in, in County of Blessings 101, everyday noticing is more of a process of looking out for one and one and uh, oneself and also looking out for each other. And many participants' photos and stories almost also illustrate how sound and the process of listening play a, in, uh, a critical role in their evident noticing or navigating in, in navigating safety. For instance, uh, Ms. Juanette's photo portrays uncut bushes and weeds across the street from her community garden. She had been concerned for a long time that some random intruders could pass through this uncared for space without her seeing them. Even though the wild weeds blocked uh, her, her view of the space, as you can see in the picture, um, <clears throat> sorry, Miss Wanets told us that she often listened carefully to the trees moving and wind blowing. If somebody is coming towards her, she would be able to hear the movement from weeds and trees. She told us like, you need to use all of your skills to notice what is happening around you. And while these weeds signal some broader system, systematic cha challenges faced by Detroit neighborhoods, such as the lack of cities uh, accountability and the ongoing dispossession, Ms. Wanette had to compromise and work with the weeds to achieve a sense of safety in this very constrained material condition. And Ms. Wanette's practice of noticing can be viewed as the very manifestation of this conflicting rela relationality and the ongoing negotiation of safety within these relations. So in this way, every noticing is very, is multi-sensorial, rooted in the collaborative looking out for each other and deeply situated in the local knowledge accumulated over time and the knowledge of knowing what is typical to them. So how, how they look like or sound and how they look like or sound like in their neighborhoods. So this situated knowledge and viewpoints um, embedded in everyday noticing really help us to contrast it from large scale surveillance infrastructures, reductive gates from nowhere. For example, in Ms. Toya's photo, I always feel like somebody's watching me shows the intersection in her neighborhood. Um, as you can see in this photo, there's a surveillance sensor on top of the pole. However, there was another surveillance camera at, in the section, at this intersection that was removed a while ago before this photo was taken. Ms. Toya was once interested in finding out if the camera had documented any evidence of graffiti and housebreakings happening in her neighborhood. However, she was not able to find any public information on who was behind the re now removed camera. She said, Camera surrounding us is common and we often know who or what entity is playing Big Brother, um, but how uncomfortable when the authorities can't really identify who is behind the camera. Um, Ms. Toya's experience here illustrates a kind of like information and power imbalance here, again, embedded in a large scale surveillance infrastructures. And it, it is exactly the case from nowhere that makes it really hard for residents or communities to hold infrastructure accountable. And similarly, Another participant, uh, Mr. Linderick, discussed how the same phenomenon would be interpreted very differently by community members who are situated in the neighborhood in the relations versus the veiler or algorithms behind the surveillance cameras that are removed from the scene or removed from a local setting. 
during the photo voice project, Mr. Lin Derek's photos was like totally different from all the other participants. So um, he was really creative in the way that he used photography to document all the surveillance cameras that he would come in, encounter on a very typical day of his, of, of, of his life. And he put everything together as a collage. It's very shocking, you know, like when, 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 when for, for him, he himself, and also for any viewers who is actually seeing this photo. So he said, because when you see your neighbor, you know that you know that is your neighbor. And my neighbor is taking out of the trash or whatever, going to the go, go, or going to the back of the house. But what the surveiller would see is like there is a young man approaching the back of the house. They see it more of a danger as you wouldn't see it as a danger because you already know them. Some of those companies are not even in the country. They're looking at it with the whole different outlook of what is actually going on. Uh, on their camera than a community person would. As Mr. Landerich sharply pointed out here, in a large-scale surveil large surveillance infrastructure, local viewpoints rooted in the lived experiences are replaced by a viewpoint at a distance. Even though residents' everyday noticing and surveillance infrastructure seemingly share the similar visual process of seeing, an ordinary situation could be misinterpreted as safety threat when removed from its entangled relations and treated as a standalone unit of examination or analysis. So returning to the overarching questions, how to think, how to rethink surveillance, and the question that Tawana posed earlier, do we even call it surveillance? We propose a concept of safety through noticing. And we argue that it to dis that disrupting the gaze from nowhere requires the redistribution of what is visible and sensible. This, what, what this really means is to trouble the dominant reductive visions embedded in the regime of surveillance and safety, we need to decenter and redistribute what is visible and sensible from the large scale surveillance infrastructure. And as an alternative, we push for the shift from surveillance and safety to what we call safety through noticing. And as we have shown, safety through noticing opens up a multitude of or the fluid meanings of safety on the one hand and the multiplicity of safety and the practices of navigating safety in fact illustrated why equating surveillance and control with safety is internally reductive and limited. And going forward, what does safety through noticing mean here? So first, everyday noticing is imbricated in lived experiences and lived materialities. It is simultaneously a, a skill for, for survival and an act of more than human care, very similar to what Tawana mentioned earlier. So attending to the practices of everyday noticing could help us to scrutinize the intersectional material consequences brought about by surveillance infrastructures, uh, if we think about one as photo. And at the, at, 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 the, at the same time, it offers opportunities for us to speculate the possible relations and alternative material configurations in which new meanings of situated safeties, safety and ontological possibilities could emerge. And second, everyday noticing is a site of critique. It, it really invites us to return to the local and hyperlocal in our design efforts. This means to return to the local situated knowledge existing relations or new relations and the local materialities. Indeed, the everyday noticing practices we observed in this photo voice project could not be scaled up. And in fact, they're not meant to be scaled up. Um, for example, it, it wouldn't be rather arbitrary to like think how we could scale up Miss Wanet's noticing of the weeds. Um, but these acts of everyday noticing become powerful counter narratives to the present premises of delocalization and the ontolo ontology of separation reinforced in our modern capitalist society through surveillance infrastructures. And through a more than human intersectional lens, we in HCI or UX, UX research and design should be able to continue to make visible counter narratives of lived experiences to thwart the hegemonic cultural. A, a hegemonic surveillance as safety and account for safety through noticing, just like what we aim to do through this photo voice project. And this will guide us moving forward or moving toward imagining a new more than human world that put a local and a communal relationality to the fore and that no longer centered on the prescribed fear. 
Together, the second case study helped us to attend to the question of how might we rethink surveillance through local relations and sensibilities. And again, rethinking surveillance requires researchers, community partners, community members, and designers to really return to the local, the local experiences, situated knowledge and relational meanings of safety on the ground. Instead of designing technologies for abstracting and analyzing individuals at data points, we need to think about how does design for noticing would look like, or imagine how design for noticing would look like. And similar to what Tawana mentioned earlier about the surveillance, surveillance for love or country blessing 101, people might love in different ways. And how well, the meaning of safety is very multiple and fluid as well. So the question would be how to attend to the multiple meanings of safety and account for the situated processes where the meanings of safety is negotiated and the sense of safety is achieved. And perhaps more importantly, this requires us to shift away from the overarching techno solutionist ideology of designing and deploying new surveillance technologies to address the safety issues or seeing safety as issues and redirect our attention to supporting locally situated relations and more than human entanglement. And next, I'd like to talk more about the methodological contributions and reflections of these two case studies and what, what they mean to us and how both the participatory speculative design approach and the photo voice approach could be meaningful to um, HCS ongoing effort in decentering hegemonic social and cultural dominations, particularly the capitalist patriarchal and racialized logics embedded in the design and deployment of most of today's technologies we see, and why it is important to engage community members or communities that are the most, that are minoritized impacted in this very process of decentering. A key question that we sought to start answering and reflecting on is what Professor Roderick Crooks posted in his recent article, Seeking the Liberation, how to re reintegrate the production of knowledge with the study of the implications of the knowledge. I would like to talk about four pillars or four um, factors through which these two cases contribute to this process. First, fostering relationships um, in both projects, the community-based imaginaries of alternative economies and the residents' photos of their everyday negotiation of safety, both make visible um, the existing complex relations within the communities. And at the same time, one of the most important part of both projects is really um, that they both created or crafted a space for community members to come together, get to know each other. In other words, get to know your neighbors. This shared space is also stage opportunities for new encounters and foster new relations. And as we have shown, it is exactly through these relations that the this, this sense of safety is produced and a sense of care is, is, is negotiated and the new opportunities for preferable futures could emerge. And second, noticing different viewpoints. So we need to bear in mind that no community is completely homogeneous. Like even within the East Side Detroit neighborhoods or um, within a specific community, there are a lot of different viewpoints. No, not everyone in the community sees or sensitizes the world in the exact same way. For example, in the participatory speculative design project, whose needs should be prioritized looks very differently for each individual at the beginning of the workshop. And in the photo voice project, how residents perceived the meaning of safety was not the same. Um, for each one of them. And however, it is through these approaches and that community members and stakeholders could come together and have dialogues with one another. And it's through these dialogues, community members, community organizers, and even researchers and designers uh, and other stakeholders, uh, probably policymakers, would have the opportunity to notice and no learn about community members' different situated viewpoints and challenge their own taken for granted frames of references and then reflect on the limitation of our own viewpoints. For example, like Tawana mentioned earlier, community members were able to notice how love was sensed and interpreted differently. And in the case of photo voice, participants were able to learn about the stories of why particular kinds of safety was featured in, in someone's photos. Um, and they were able to uh, re think about like what kind of safety uh, might have been ignored and it should be taken into account going forward. And this ongoing processes of noticing different viewpoints and challenging the taken for granted references points 
could perhaps inform new ways of knowing and relating to one another and inform collective actions going uh, go, uh, collective actions among the communities going forward. And third, building community capacity. Um, as we have shown in, in, in both cases, community capacity building is a critical component. In both cases, community members were able to develop some sort of ta tangible digital skills and knowledge, such as taking photos or smartphones, sharing photos with families and friends, um, AI or Internet of Things. At the same time, participants also started asking critical questions regarding the biases and ethics of uh, socio-technical infrastructures. And this is especially important when we consider the long tradition of knowledge extraction in the academic setting or corporate setting and the ongoing power imbalance between the communities and the research institutions or corporates, also between the community members and researchers or community members and designers. It is very important for us to think about like how to make sure like the approaches we adopt are actually generative and uh, generative for community members, especially when the communities we're working with are likely to be the most impacted by the te technologies we're designing or studying. And finally, mobilizing resources. Um, both projects are not possible without the ongoing efforts, labor and services of our community partners and community members. And in a community-based participatory efforts like ours, it is important for us to keep re reciprocity in mind and keep reflecting on what com community members and community partners are getting out of the engagement. And this collaboration should be the opportunities to channel human and social resources both to and within communities. And in the case of the speculative design, our community partners started engaging the speculative speculative design efforts in a local political campaign. And in the case of photo voice, our community partner has bridged the work with their ongoing efforts in fostering community resilience in the in Detroit East Side neighborhoods. And we are working on continuing the educations on safety and surveillance in local community gardens to engage more community members in this discussion. Therefore, key to the ongoing effort of rethinking surveillance is the question of how do we engage everyday people in the process of reimagination and rethinking surveillance, and how can we disseminate the community narratives to the, inform the impacted communities and the future design and development of technologies. Together, through these two case studies, um, we have talked about the possible ways to rethink the reductive surveillance infrastructures and their underlying logics of capitalist production, rationalization, and racialized social management from the entry point of economy and neighborhood safety. Through the case of speculative, speculating alternative economies, we unpacked ways to trouble the coercive surveillance with an embedded sense of care while prioritizing community's values, history, and uh, strength. And the underlying question becomes who conceptualizes, designs, and owns the surveillance technologies. And second, through the photo voice project, we have highlighted that rethinking surveillance requires us to return to the local, the local relations, local knowledge, and local sensibilities through attuning to everyday noticing as the alternative. And finally, and perhaps more importantly, rethinking surveillance should prioritize minoritized communities that are mostly impacted by surveillance technologies. In other words, engaging community members in the very process of knowledge production and reimagination. I'd like to end the pr uh, presentation here and take your questions. Before, before I do, um, I'd like to thank our research team, colleagues and collaborators, community partners, and of course our founders, Google Research and NSF, um, and Tawana, I do have uh, some questions for you. <laughs> so, um, like, we'd like to hear your thoughts on, you know, like, first, like, in your current roles, how might you reimagine or re engineer surveillance infrastructures or technologies based on the work we've presented today? Um, and what specific concepts, if any, come to mind after hearing this work? Or what would your approach be to begin con concretizing or piloting them? And who might we consider collaborating as next steps, like industry, industry practitioners, artists, designers, historians, um, and also how do we create technological feedback loops? Uh, as what I mentioned, at the, what points do we check for un, unintended consequences when we're developing, designing and deploying technology in the communities? And when do we circle back the knowledge 
um, or engage their community members in the process of um, knowledge production? And what other approaches might we consider to enable new ways of thinking and connections? Thank you. All right. This has been such a great talk or two talks, and I love how they go together so perfectly. It's uh, such a rich story. Um, yeah. So I guess we can open it up to anybody who wants to answer these questions. Feel free to ask questions too. We, we just said, if you didn't have any questions, then, then, you know, you feel free to answer some of those. Um, I was curious about like the technique in general of of photo voice is the important part, like pairing the, the quotes with, with pictures and are those curated by a single person or are you kind of curating it after the fact? Um, no, I think the, yeah, that's a really great question. I think for photo voice is kind of different from like, you know, in, in HCI we had, um, uh, like photo elicitation or like visual ethnography like it's different from those methods in the way that the whole process should be, like the whole process is, is participatory in the way that mm -hmm. um the, the the captions and narratives are um developed by uh, the participants of course it's, it's a co-production process i can say like there's no i i didn't really play any role here but it's more like how uh, or like the research team or the community team doesn't really play a role here it's like collective co-production process but um, the photos and the captions are developed uh, during the process of photo taking. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, other questions? Uh, Marcella, do you want to talk about what you've written here? Yeah. Sorry. Unmuted. Um, there you go. Yeah. I just say um, it reminded me of cultural probes. And I know you mentioned the word probe. So you probably already cited it. So, um, and it also reminded me of. Um, Back in the day, I, I went to a workshop that Eric Palos and Ken Anderson did at um, UB Comp when it was in Orange County in 2005. And I, I know Eric used to do a lot of kind of interesting stuff with probes back in the day, but now that he's at Berkeley, I don't think he gets to do as interesting stuff. So um, I, I don't know if there is really a UB Comp community or an urban computing community community or is everything kind of going through Kai nowadays? Um, I, I'll, I'll add that there's some inspiration from Eric. Eric, Eric was on my um, committee. I, Alex, I don't know if you knew that, but but I used photo elicitation in my dissertation work and, and um, Alex kind of built on that and, and did the, the photo voice. Um, Alex, I mean, Alex is, I think we tend to publish uh, Kai and CSCW. I think Alex is considering um, Ubicom for sure, uh, because of the nature of surveillance and, um, you know, surveillance being everywhere. So I think there's, it, 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 the community is, it, it still exists <laughs> to answer your question. And it is one that we have um, thought about. Thank yeah. you for your question and feedback. Yeah, I remember the cultural probes study at Intel. <laughs> May I ask a question? I was interested throughout your presentations that you I won't mean this in a negative sense, but it felt like you were avoiding engaging in discussion of law enforcement and authority. And I feel like my sense, and I'm certainly no expert, would welcome your thoughts. My sense is that most of the surveillance infrastructure that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis is imposed by uh, often police authorities or government authorities or others. And uh, obviously communities of color have had um, let's polite word, a checkered uh, history of interacting with these authorities. And I'm wondering if in your participatory work, did the participants bring up those authorities or talk about their uh, their interactions and, and who, you know, you mentioned who was behind the camera. Did, did the authority figures or authority organizations like the police enter into that conversation? Um, of course, like law enforcement and city government is like, a huge actor um, in the surveillance infrastructures in the city of Detroit. Not not only about the the the, the, the law enforcement and the city government, but also like a private private uh, corporates and the tech companies in the city of Detroit as well. So part of the project, part of the, my dissertation actually looks into like how um, 
law enforcement and the private, so public and private institutions are actually, um, sorry, my cat is here, uh, developing or like deploying surveillance infrastructures in the city of Detroit and how certain kind of rhetorics are being reinforced. For example, like how specific kind of safety is being defined in this narrative. Um, of course, like, uh, and the police, the police and law enforcement has been actually occurred multiple times during both projects, I would say. Um, I, I, will, I will talk about the photo voice first. So um, I think photo voice is interesting in the way that, again, a lot of participants are older, uh, are like more senior uh, participants in the communities. So in a way, we need to really highlight that there is also this very different generational perceptions of law enforcement and the relationship with the law enforcement, especially consider um, the ongoing history, like long history of like the police brutality and the police presence in the, in the, in the, in the neighborhoods. So um, it's very different. Like um, sometimes participants can really, like, there's, I think there are two things, like two layers here. One is need to emphasize and talk about the police departments or the, the presence of police uh, behind the surveillance infrastructures, especially Project Greenlight. And also the second is really the technology is real. Technology is not only like an extension of the surveillance, but also think about the, the, the biases of technology as well. So both cases actually uh, surface in the photo voice project. For example, in the Mr. and Derek's photos, um, he was actually, that, that photo actually triggered a long discussion around law enforcement and everything. Because um, when he was actually taking a photo, he went to all the different, uh, he he went into the different buildings, different uh, institutions to talk with people who are working there. Say like, oh, who is like, why do you have the surveillance infrastructure? Oh, surveillance cameras here. Are they on or off? Like, and then he started saying like, oh no, like, oh, although the, all the, all the surveillance cameras are there, they probably mean different things. For example, if the surveillance, like he was talking about, like one of the surveillance camera is off, so. Like if I'm actually experiencing any sort of danger in the parking lot, then no one will see me. And why is the, why there's a surveillance camera there? And he also actually went into the police station to actually try to ask, like, can I take a photo of like the 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 the, the, the cameras in the police station? And of course the answer would be no. And like when when he was sharing this photo, like this like power dynamics and power structure behind the surveillance infrastructure started to surfacing and people started to make the connection like this technology is actually very much associated with law enforcement it's not really like a standalone piece instead it needs to be situated in a, in a huge infrastructure of different and uh, actors and how all those things come together yeah and Tuana, do you want to mention the, the law enforcement well, in the i'll just i'll just add that i think going into this um we we i don't think we were avoiding law enforcement we we knew very much that you know they were a player and you know part of the the you know part of our goal was to you know uh, uncover alternative narratives around this right like I, I feel like policing is really the main narrative that we hear from a law enforcement perspective you know what are the alternatives to that yeah excellent thank you yeah. thank you Also, I wanted to uh, call out and compliment your use of uh, Afrofuturism in your design work. Um, I think there's an incredibly rich tradition there that is not nearly well enough uh, understood or mined. So kudos for doing that. I thought that was great. Thank you. And a shout out to uh, uh, Christina Harrington, uh, who put that workbook together, which I think is very well done. Uh, if I may, I'd like to make a, ask a couple of questions. So this works really exciting. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, it's really, really cool. Uh, so it's a lot, lot to absorb because it's new, <laughs> you know. Um, um, so, so with both studies, my my perception is that, in a way, th these are critical works, right? Where where folks who live in the community go out and observe. Uh, there in the first study, there's there's some. You know some critical inquiry about around these these different systems, as it were, or the systems of surveillance. In the second study, um, you know, really, it's it's our experience of the body, what we see, what we what we what what, what we see around us, uh, in terms of sort of what what the interface is between us and this this sort of surveillance world. Um, did 
did you get into looking at design of solutions? Uh, uh, and my question really is, what kinds of abstractions, if any, did you use in terms of talking about how things might work differently? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. I mean, I think that's part of next steps. I avoid using the term solutions because I don't think we have them. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I mean, I think that's a that's kind of a next step. And and you know, back to um, uh, Mar Marcella's earlier question about you know Ubicomp. But I mean, I think that's one thing we want to um, do is conceptualize what might how, you know what might this look like. So this is like question number two. What specific concepts you know might might come to mind after hearing about this work? And um, you know, as a next step, I think it would be like show these concepts, not just one or two, but uh, you know, 10, 15 different concepts and um, get feedback um, from, you know, hear uh, community uh, members uh, thoughts about them and, and co-design, you know, together continue to rework. So it's like, here's what, here's what we think we got from, from, you know, these, these two studies. Um, what are your, what are your thoughts and how might you, you know, change them or what would you add to them? And then start the process from there um, before creating or, you know, piloting anything concrete, but just conceptualizing this. So I think that's something we want to do next. If I may follow up, um, there was a recent article in Technology Review, which was a critique of design thinking, uh, really looking at design thinking as, as um, in the way that it's practiced in sort of a business setting as extractive, that we, you know, consultants come in, we interview, we visualize, and then we go away. <laughs> so we take the signal away, and we also leave behind, uh, uh, you know, in the frame of the article, expectations that can't be fulfilled. So, so, but that said, design thinking is one technique that, uh, in terms of participatory design at the conceptual level, it, that comes to mind for me. The other one for me is, is systems thinking, uh, uh, and I guess you know the the evolution of that might be the work of uh, Peter Senga, uh, uh, and so I'm curious if that that if ev if either of those approaches are sort of on your maps, or or if you have a feeling uh, as to sort of how. A community organization, a community partner might be able to work with so those techniques in, in this setting. So thank you. Alex, did you want to take that or did you want me to start? I can I can take a step. I think like uh, also like back to the first question too. I think besides design, I think one thing that I like Tawana and I've been thinking about is really like what Tawana mentioned is who owns the technology. And like it's not only about who owns who is using the technology or on the tech, technical artifacts, but the ownership of the whole infrastructure in which like the data, for example, where the data is, it, it is stored, how the technology is designed, how the data is actually being used. So like this, I, I think tied it back to the, your question of like both design thinking and system thinking is really important to like uh, also back to your question of like uh, your, your point of uh, being uh, design thinking, being abstractive, exactly thinking about how like, we can bring the design thinking and system thinking back to back to the local or even hyper local, and how like because for example in in one of the workshop or in one of the uh, panel we did together um actually one participant told me if you want to talk more about that feel free to jump in there's one participant said like we have green light in in the city of Detroit why don't we have a yellow light instead of like having the police departments to control or to own the infrastructure? Can we like, can, is, is it possible to have a community owned yellow light project? A yellow light project, like everything looks the same, but it's owned completely owned by the community. So I wonder like how technologies like that could look like and how like uh, the, the local situated knowledge could contribute to um, the design, post design thinking and system thinking that way. Yeah, I, I would add that I think we're, um... Uh, I don't know that we're calling what we're doing design thinking. I think one of one of my takeaways is, you know, what are these new approaches look like? Um, and, you know, I think we're learning, too, as researchers, there's a work that we did, you know, um, we've used the term infrastructuring <laughs> um, and thinking about what are, you know, what are the different components of how are people interacting? It's not like a very, it's not clean, it's not like a clean, you know, module here, module here, this component here. 
And so what does how what does that do to you know technological development, right? Like how 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 do we rethink these systems? I mean, I think um, that that is something that that I would like to explore more. Um, is it possible? I'm not afraid to ask that question either. Like, is there a role for technology here, right? Or should you know technology, you know, as the community participants said, is supporting us, right? It's not taking over what we do, but it's in support of us. And so what are those things that technology can effectively be in support of um, for, for, for us? I, I think that's, a, that's another question I think that we have to consider. Thank you for that question, that's really good, yeah. yeah. Tawana and Alex, I wanted to just say thank you for a really wonderful uh, presentation and I'm um, sorry for my camera off the lights are low my eyes are a little sensitive right now but um, just wanted to you know just chime in and, and say a couple things one I teach urban design students so I'm in the built environment amongst uh, friends here with L um, but what one of the things that we talk about is the idea of eyes on the street and looking at ways in which you can have implicit forms of communal relationships with uh, safety and uh, kind of community interaction. And I, I just wonder, you know, if you could kind of speak to that amongst other disciplines outside of the idea of, of um, uh, technology and maybe how these kind of communal responses might be uh, integrated in this way, because I really like this idea of noticing. I think that's super fascinating. Um, and, and I think just there's something really uh, incredible about maybe uh, flipping the, the lens around and, and saying, you know, if we're talking about sensing in the very intimate way. Uh, when you make neighbors the sensors, that that's a very different interaction than your your surveillance infrastructure that might be like attached to a building and separate from from people. When people are kind of reflexively interacting with their place, it it changes the the paradigm quite a lot. And so maybe if you could speak a little bit to some of these more implicit forms of of uh, connection, maybe outside of just uh, giving people cameras and, and 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 walking through some of that, are there other ways that you've seen them kind of taking stock of their environment and 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 noting different aspects of of these qualities that you're talking about? Uh Thank you for the question. Could you clarify a little bit more? Like, what do you mean by uh, besides the holding cameras going around? And yeah, could you could you uh, clarify the question? Sure, sure. I, I suppose what I mean is that um, if 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 we're kind of re understanding or at least reorganizing our thoughts here about what is um, taking stock of a community's environment, whether it's a device that's attached to a building or, you know, some kind of, um, you know, Internet of Things sensor or something like that. And mm -hmm. we understand that that's entrenched in a certain power dynamic because it is imposed into that community. Mm -hmm. um, how is it that um, giving agency to community members to actually go out and sense their community in some way um, has kind of uh, rendered a different kind of dynamic um, and given more agency back to those community members? And then in, in addition to that, what are some other ways to kind of think about methods of, of sensing the community in, in a way that is kind of communally informed rather than just being an agent or, or a sensor in the kind of typical sense? Um, so rather than just being someone to catalog information and then put it in a repository and then hopefully someone else reviews it and you kind of get feedback that way, how is it that it can be a kind of communal relationship, much like the kind of eyes on the street example, where if it's your neighbor who's watching, and you've kind of touched on that a little bit with like just noticing your neighbor and their activity or lack thereof, mm -hmm. it, it brings about a different kind of interaction. And I would just love to get your uh, input, at, you know, from uh, designing the study I, and so forth. I can jump in just quickly. I, you know, heard about this effort in Detroit. I think it's called Green Chairs, Not Green Lights. Yeah. where these are, you know, um, the, you know, I'm from the South and, you know, back in the days we sit on the porches and we'd look out, right. The, the people would, you know, we would, we would make sure that, that, you know, the kids, did, well, they'd make sure that I didn't misbehave. I knew that their eyes were watching as a kid um, uh, because the, you know, the, the, the neighbors knew who we were and I knew they would call my mom. I knew that they were the quote unquote police. Um, uh, and I, I want to say um, that, 
Uh, I appreciate your question, Ryan. I am uh, working with, you know, looking excited to work, you know, with architects and uh, urban planners uh, for this reason alone, because there are like things within the built environment that lend themselves to, um, I guess, you know, safety in, in these ways. I mean, I think we, and, and, and I didn't talk about this in the speculative design project. Um, Alex noticed it and, you know, found it in his work too, but there's this, you know, community gardens. Like Detroit is such a wonderful city, but there are, there are a lot of efforts to um, grow these community gardens and think about how that, you know, how people can, can um, uh, interact around, you know, these types of spaces. And I think that changes, as you can see in Alex's um, work, you know, that changes how we view um, safety within a uh, neighborhood. Uh, thanks for sharing that link. Um, but uh, Alex, you can, you know, build on what I've said, but, but uh, Ryan, that, those are the first things that came to mind after um, hearing your question. No, yeah, I think I totally agree. I think there are two layers here. One thing is the existing relations within the communities. Oftentimes, we also, especially in the city of Detroit, we often hear narratives about how, like the the the, the negative connotation of the city of Detroit, as if there's like the, the 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 communities is broken, as if the infrastructure is broken, but like projects like this photo voice or efforts like this photo voice or there are a lot of community organizing activists who are going on in the city of Detroit. What is what what they have been doing is really to make visible a lot of the existing relations and the connections within the community, such as this green chair, not green green light uh, efforts. And there are a lot of similar efforts going on in the city of Detroit. Like by making visible all this all, all these relations is to in itself is to resist this narrative of um individuals are 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 are, are not interconnected state of detroit is broken um but on the other hand really like also what similar to this green chair not green light is doing is really to through besides making visible the existing relations but really think about how um approaches like this could start uh, elevating or fostering new relations um, and getting people to come together to um, to engage in this small like lo local world making or community working projects like there are a lot of photos that we didn't really show here today there are photos of people talking about very similar to green chair uh, not green light uh, project like there's a lady talking about how there's multiple layers of safety that uh, she was trying to do including like uh, she was putting a chair in front of a porch and there's a reflection uh, there's a, a reflection glass on the window um, and then there's a, a amazon door ring doorbell and there's a light over there and she called it like multiple layers of safety but the message that she wants to put forward is that our community has been separated more and more by the city government by the police by the institutions um, and it is through through these photos I want to show I want to showcase that the relations is so important in our communities and I want people to put their put their chairs on their porch and look at each other look out for each other more and it is like through the message through the photos it is their intention to engage the community members in this world making process um, so I hope that answers your question very much so thank you yeah. It looks like there's a, a question in the chat um, from Elle. Um, Elle, did you want to, um, you, you want me to raise it or, or did you want to, is Elle still here? Oh, yeah. Hi. Okay. Hi. Yeah, uh, I can't even remember what. It is um, answering the question, my... who is behind yes. the curtain? Okay. Yeah, um, you can feel free to take take that. Uh, if you have, if you would like me to clarify what I mean by that, um, I... have um, we uncovered a motive for transparency for who is watching? So a motive like, from our participants about uh, transparency. Is that well from every stakeholder involved with the surveilling? Um, environment. So um, you want, I think that I'm presuming that the goal of surveilling is, is, is actually at its heart, like really to protect um, 
the communities around the area that it is surveilling or, or, or control people, which is perhaps not exactly like a good goal. So, um, coming up with the, a way to um, be transparent about who is watching might give some agency to the people who are being surveilled um, and have you come across that sort of idea in your research? And if so, are there motives for people who are watching these surveillance footage, like videos or, you know, whatever live? Um, is there a motive for those people to sort of put their name on it? Um. I can start answering that question probably. Um, I think for the motives, mo like oh, uh, I think what you you, you mentioned is very in, in, in very interesting or correct in the way that a lot of surveillance infrastructures we see are black boxed. In the way, for example, like the the huge surveillance infrastructure, probably what is visible to to us is like the surveillance cameras. Or in the city of Detroit, the 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 case will be the flashing green light. Uh, on a small businesses, like that is the basic manifest manifestation of how the whole surveillance infrastructure will look like. But the whole infrastructure and the underlying logics are oftentimes hidden. Um, and the, in, it's interesting, like in the photo voice project, for example, people started to asking a lot of questions or like try to peek into what is behind the scene or try to start um, black boxing a little bit by, by themselves, for example, like uh, going back to Mr. Jarek's photos that I, like that you, that that we showed earlier, like he took all this like surveillance cameras that he noticed on a typical day, and then it was like he literally was like, oh, I never realized there's so many surveillance cameras out there, and all the surveillance cameras means different things, and it's also sim like similarly because like he was like, I go to the, the supermarket every day, I go to grocery store every day, those surveillance cameras are there, but it's not really something that I will pay attention to or notice because of my taken for granted way of seeing, because I always just go there and get my stuff and leave. I never noticed there's surveillance cameras there. And this like taking photos or like be intentionally taking photos of the surveillance cameras in the way it's like forced him to, or uh, allowed him to kind of encounter surveillance infrastructure infrastructures and think about why they're there and think about like the, 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 the underlying logics inside of the, uh, the black box and also uh, in our uh, ethnography work in the city of Detroit we also talked with folks who used to work in a real-time crime center who actually have the access to who are actually like actually monitoring all the surveillance footage uh, from the green light cameras um, and like it's very interesting like very every single individuals who are working in the real-time crime center is not like they're they don't really have any discretion. They don't really have any agency going on. And they also have a lot of negotiation, a lot of room for negotiation in this process. Like, what is this? Um, you know, like, it's interesting, like, in the way that some business owners will call the police, for example, and tell them, like, oh, something's happened. Uh, but the fact that, because, sorry, let me take a step back. Um, in, 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 the in, the, in Project Green Light, uh, for business who have the green light in the, uh, in the city, when they call the police, they can get the priority from the police department, meaning like uh, the, 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 the police will detach their, dispatch their, their the, the police cars uh, in, uh, with priority. So for some business owners, they, they intend to call the business, the, the, they intend to call the police not to, uh, if someone is like selling drugs or doing anything funky in front of the uh, the stores, they're calling the business not to ask the police to actually get to this get to the location, but to showcase or like as a muscle flexing thing, like I can call the police and the police can actually um, respond to my to to my call quickly. So there's a a lot of room for negotiation in this process in the way that uh, surveillance infrastructure is not always like um, completely. Um, stringent in this way. So I think back to the question of like thinking about who is behind our curtain, definitely started to uh, initiate a lot of critical discussions around the area of like what this gray, 
gray area is and how to really help us to think about what is behind um, behind the curtain and think about uh, how we can uh, make visible the invisibilized power dynamics and in infrastructures. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I just thought that there was an obvious, um, like, our relationship between the the people who are being watched and the people who are doing the watching, and uh, what can you do to empower the people who are being watched with um, keeping in mind that there is, like, typically, there's always bias. Um, from the people who are watching. I think what I might have heard from Alex's responses is, is that um, at least tell people how, how it's working, right? Who is, you know, start to um, make transparent that what that black box is. I mean, I do remember hearing people say, um, we don't even know if this thing works. <laughs> like, is there someone? And so they develop their own, you know, mode of thinking like, I don't think anybody's watching, um, but maybe it makes them feel safe or maybe it makes that person feel safe to know that it's there, if that makes sense, or or it's just this perception like, well, it's doing something, right? Um, but it, I think one step is just to, to be clear and transparent about how it works. <laughs> what is facial recognition, right? Like, how does that work, <laughs> right? Um, I think that's a, that's a step. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that would at least give uh, empower residents to to say yes or no, right? Um, because if you're coming with oh this is safe, it's a green light now you can you know you get priority, you feel safe, you know they're like yes, everybody wants yeah everybody wants to be safe, but or you know that that notion, but when you're you know critical about it, it's like wait a second, this isn't really what we need or ask for. It's not working in the way that you know. Um, I, I think that allows conversation and, and choice. <clears throat> I see that there's one last question. I don't know if we have time to answer it. Oops, I was muted. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was my question. You've mentioned power imbalances. Um, we can take this, this issue of transparency as a sort of a, a micro case of that. Uh, people don't know who's watching and then behind the people who are actually watching the police the dispatch center and so on there are people who um, paid for them and the people who paid for them are the ones who are really calling the shots and they don't want you to know who they are and they don't necessarily want the system to make you safer they want it to make them safer to have their interests upheld. Um, how could you deal with that? I think, again, the conversations, uh, Alex mentioned the panel. We had, I mean, I think some questions that were raised in the panel really got to um, questions of capitalism. Like, wait, what? Who, who, I mean, there were questions of, of ownership that were being raised um, that hadn't been raised before because we really hadn't had a conversation in, or, or a place to, to be together to even think through some of these things. So, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, it, it's just that, you know, Alex mentioned Mr. Linderick before the photo voice study would just go every day and just not, you know, not really think about it being there. And I think some of our research raises questions about, well, how do we deploy a technology? You know, it's like these things are magically there. Now they're everywhere. But how did that even happen? You know, where were the opportunities for people to question what is this thing being installed in my neighborhood? Like that doesn't, it doesn't seem to happen. And I think part of our work is pushing for how do we have these, <laughs> at least have a feedback loop where, you know, we're told that it's, it's working. We can question what's the change, like who's benefiting, what's, you know, what's happening so that we can say yay or, or nay to it. But the way things work now is just, you know, being deployed and to these communities and there's, you know, they don't really have a choice. 
Um, and I also want to highlight that it's also important like to, that's why like this process of like education and learning is really important in, in, in the work, in this kind of work, especially in, for example, in the city of Detroit, there's a lot of like activists going on, activist activities going on uh, and activist groups and coalitions doing political education in educating the community members of what surveillance means and what this power dynamics actually is. The, what because a lot of times the power imbalance are hidden. Like it's not really, it's not like it's hidden, it's not like visible to everyday participants. And there are multiple ways of showing that power imbalance or talk about that power imbalance with our community members. And that is definitely the first step um, to actually start challenging the power imbalance or like to, to, to actually start rethinking what the alternatives could look like. Awesome. Well, we are uh, about out of time. Thank you, everybody, for uh, such a deep discussion here. I really appreciate the engagement here. And also, thank you to the speakers, Tawanda and Alex, for, for doing this. Um, just such a great talk. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us, Joe. And thanks, everyone, for, for taking time out to be here. Um, and it was such a pleasure meeting you. Hopefully, I'll, I'll uh, get to see you in person. <laughs>